I have never heard an even approximately adequate explanation of the horror at Martin's Beach. Despite the large number of witnesses, no two accounts agree, and the testimony taken by local authorities contain the most amazing discrepancies. Perhaps this haziness is natural in view of the unheard of character of the horror itself, the almost paralytic terror of all who saw it, and the efforts made by the fashionable Wavecrest Inn to hush it up after the publicity created by Professor Alton's article, are hypnotic powers confined to recognise humanity. humanity. Against all these obstacles, I am striving to present a coherent version, for I beheld the hideous occurrence. I believe it should be known in view of the appalling possibilities it suggests. Modern's beach is once more popular as a watering place, but I shudder when I think of it. Indeed, I cannot look at the ocean at all now without shuddering. Fate is not always without a sense of drama and climax, hence the terrible happening of August 8, 1922, swiftly followed a period of minor and agreeably wonderful excitement at Martin's Beach. On May 17, the crew of the fishing smack Alma of Gloucester, under Captain James P. Orne, killed, after a battle of nearly 40 hours, a marine monster whose size and aspect produced the greatest possible stir in scientific circles and caused Boston naturalists to take every precaution for its taxidermic preservation. The object was some 50 feet in length, of roughly cylindrical shape and about 10 feet in diameter. It was unmistakably a gilled fish in its major affiliations, but with certain curious modifications such as rudimentary forelegs and six-toed feet in place of pectoral fins, which prompted the widest speculation. Its extraordinary mouth, its thick and scaly hide, and its single, deep-set eye were wonders scarcely less remarkable than its colossal dimensions. And when the naturals pronounced it an infant organism, which could not have been hatched more than a few days, Public interest mounted to extraordinary heights. Cats known with typical Yankee shrewdness obtained a vessel large enough to hold the object in its soul and arranged for the exhibition of his prize. With Judicus Carpentry, he prepared what amounted to an excellent marine museum and, sailing south to the wealthy resort district of Martin's Beach, anchored at the Hotel Wharf and reaped a harvest of admission fees. The intrinsic marvelousness of the object, and the importance which it clearly bore in the minds of many scientific visitors from near and far, combined to make it the season sensation. That it was absolutely unique, unique to a scientifically revolutionary degree, was well understood. The naturalist had shown plainly that it radically differed from the similarly immense fish caught off the Florida coast. That, while it was obviously an inhabitant of almost incredible depths, Perhaps thousands of feet, its brain and principal organs indicated a development startlingly vast, and out of all proportion to anything associated with the fish tribe. On the morning of July 20, the sensation was increased by the loss of the vessel and its strange treasure. In the storm of the preceding night, it had broken from its moorings and vanished forever from the sight of man, carrying with it the guard who had slept aboard despite the threatening weather. Captain Orne, backed by extensive scientific interest and aided by large numbers of fishing boats from Gloucester, made a thorough and exhaustive searching cruise, but with no result other than the prompting of interest and conversation. By August 7, hope was abandoned, and Captain Orne had returned to the Wavecrest Inn to wind up his business affairs at Martin's Beach and confer with certain of the scientific men who remained there. The horror came on August 8. 